The first Federation machine that was somewhat mass produced was the RX-77 II gun cannon, but it had one big issue. Its price tag. One gun cannon cost as much as four Zakus. So with the Federation desperately needing to push out more mobile suits to catch up to Xeon, it was clear that they needed a more cost effective unit. For this, they turned to their first true mass production machine, the RGM-79 Jim. However, as with the first prototype of the gun cannon, the first prototype of the Jim cannon was far from the success that it needed to be. Known as the prototype Jim Cannon Unit 1, this was little more than a standard issue Jim with a gun cannon's head and forearms, a new backpack that presumably sorted the ammo, and a new pair of 360mm low recoil cannons. As you probably guessed, the Jim frame wasn't made to deal with the heavy weaponry that was now mounted on its shoulders, resulting in some serious balance and stability issues which also had a detrimental effect on its firing accuracy. So five days later, Unit 2 was rolled out in the hopes of dealing with those issues. The legs were now up-armored, the skirt armor reinforced, and the shoulder-mounted cannons were now housed in a new enclosure. One final change then was that the backpack was now closer to that of the original gun cannon. While it still wasn't exactly what it should have been, it was a big step in the right direction, and many of the changes made on this machine would be further refined and then carried over onto the final production version, the RGC-80 Jim Cannon. Other changes then for this finalized Jim Cannon were that the gun cannon's arms and head were now reverted back to the standard Jim, albeit with the inclusion of extra antennas on the back of the head. Thanks to this, the Jim Cannon shared 60% of its parts with the regular Jim, ensuring that mass production was easy and that ample spare parts were available when grouped together with them. The backpack was also changed again and finally the cannons went from 2 to 1 and were also slightly overhauled. It was reverted back to a 240mm caliber, the same as the gun cannon, and rather than storing the ammo inside the body or the backpack, it now used a magazine. Thanks to this, two spare magazines could be mounted onto the back skirt for extra ammo capacity. While it was most commonly armed with the standard beam spray gun, it could also be equipped with other Federation weaponry like the 100mm machine gun or the Hyper Bazooka. Also, unlike the gun cannon that it was based on, the Jim cannons were more often seen with a shield. With the upcoming North American campaign then, six of these new Jim cannons were quickly produced to provide extra fire support, and despite their hasty deployment, they would quickly prove themselves in the field. Once the California base was recaptured, mass production began in earnest at the Jobro base, and by the end of the war, 58 units are known to have existed. The aforementioned 6 that participated in the North American campaign, 19 units that participated in the African campaign, one of which being Lido Wolf's unit, the 9 units that were assigned to the Jobro Defense Force, the 14 units that participated in Operation Star 1 as part of the Revel and Tianum fleets, one of them being assigned to the Immortal 4th theme, and then the at least 3 units that participated in the Australian recapture operation as part of the White Dingo team. This then leaves 7 units unaccounted for that could have been assigned either to Asia or to Australia alongside the White Dingo team. Another source I've seen though has a slightly different explanation for the deployment of the 58 Jim Cannons. 19 were assigned to the African Front, 6 to the North American Front, which would later be assigned to the Australian Front, 9 were assigned to the Jabro Defense Force, 14 to the Tianan Fleet, and 10 to the Revel Fleet. Which one you decide to go for I'll leave up to you, but I prefer leading towards the latter explanation because it accounts for all of the Jim Cannons that were supposedly produced. By UC-0087 then, the Jim Cannon was still in active service, albeit in a mostly defensive role. The surviving units had also been upgraded with a new linear seat cockpit and were now using the then standard BOA BR S85 C2 beam rifle, also better known as the Jim 2's beam rifle. Their performance was unfortunately what you'd expect.
back to the one year war then, five or six gym cannons that participated in Operation Star 1 were upgraded to be better suitable for combat in space. The extra armor on the legs was no longer needed and was now instead replaced with extra thrusters similar to those of the gym sniper custom. This made the newly christened RGC ATS Gym Cannon Space Assault Type a much faster and more agile unit. Similarly, the 240mm cannon was now replaced with a 360mm one because stability under gravity was no longer a concern. And to increase its firepower even more, all known units used the Balzac type 380mm rocket bazooka. Despite being amazing mobile suits and despite being assigned to ace pilots, it is believed that none of these units survived the Battle of Abawa Q. Although it is highly likely that this wasn't entirely their fault. While we don't know where the two or three units assigned to the 117 squad were located, the three units assigned to the 142nd squad were on the Agar, a Salamis-class cruiser that was tasked with defending General Revel's flagship, the Magellan-class Phoebe. After the One Year War then, work began on a successor unit that would be the culmination of both the gym cannon and the gun cannon mass production type, along with some design elements of the extremely high performance Alex Gundam. This machine would be known as the RGC-83 Gym Cannon 2, and its success already began with the basic frame that it shared with the strongest gym of that time, the Gym Custom. To save time and money, many of the parts and even the production lines to produce these two units were the same. Then, thanks to its powerful reactor, the Gym Cannon 2 now sported two shoulder-mounted beam cannons and it still had enough juice left to power handheld beam weaponry as well. That being said, it would most commonly be seen with the shell-firing 90mm Gym rifle. And in worst case scenario, it also had a single beam saber mounted on its left arm and 60mm Vulcans mounted in its head. For defensive purposes then, it featured a development of the Alex Gundam's Chobham armor. But even though it retained its name, the Jim Cannon 2's Chobham armor was quite different. The most important difference being that, on the Alex, the Chobham armor went over its frame and therefore could be perched if the situation called for it. On the Jim Cannon 2, however, the Chobham armor was its armor. While this did mean that it could no longer be perched, it also made it lighter while keeping the same defensive capabilities. All of these features then came together to form an excellent fire support unit that could kick ass well into the UC-87s and even into the early UC-90s according to some sources. One thing we don't know though is exactly how many of these units were produced. Initially, it was said that not much were due to two main reasons. The first one was the usual problem, the price. And then the second one was that it was made to operate alongside the Gym Custom, another unit that had excellent performance but was never mass produced. On the flip side then, quite a few units have been spotted over the years that were operated by a variety of factions. This included the Titans, who used a development of the Gym Custom, the Gym Quell. And since we've already seen one Jim Cannon 2 working in tandem with Jim Quells, it's not a stretch to assume that they produced a few more of them to support their other Jim Quell squadrons. Later on then, they would also be seen with various anti-federation groups like the Aeugen Karanos, suggesting that enough were made to both survive and be maintained. And the Karanos version sure is a machine worth having a closer look at. Originally named the Jim Cannon 2 Lucian Bend use, it wasn't just meant as a medium range combat unit, but due to a lack of machines, it also had to perform as a close combat unit. Because of this, the single beam saber was replaced with a twin Heat Hawk setup, 
and it was painted in a dazzle camouflage in an attempt to confuse and disorient the enemy during high-speed combat. Additionally, its head sensor was strengthened and it now used a custom long rifle. So not only was this machine a better close combat machine than the original, but its mid to long range capabilities were also improved upon. And this machine would once again be overhauled with the help of Karaba. The biggest change was that the beam cannons were replaced with a megaparticle cannon on the right and a sensor unit on the left. A configuration that was quite reminiscent of the old Gun Cannon 2, albeit slightly more powerful. Other upgrades were extra sensors on the shoulders and new powerful communication antennas on the head to aid in its role as a commander unit. With all of these upgrades though, the machine was getting too heavy, so to remedy this, the leg armor was overhauled and trimmed down. This upgraded machine was then called the Jim Cannon 2 White Coral, and it was now also painted in a more traditional color scheme. One final and lesser known Jim Cannon then was the Jim Command Cannon, piloted by Simona Phyllis of the Guinea Pig team. And rather than receiving a full Jim Cannon, it almost looks like they just received the Jim Cannon specific parts and then they just found a way to graft them onto one of their gym commands that they had at their disposal. As a result, only one of these units is known to have existed. And that is where the lineage of the gym cannon ends. But just as with the gun cannon line, its influence could be felt in many future Federation machines. Machines such as the Jesta Cannon, the G Cannon, and the Javelin Cannon. So let me know down below which one is your favorite fire support unit, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more similar content in the future. As always, a big thank you to the Patreon supporters, I hope everyone watching has a great day, and I'll see you all next time.